Hello, uh, this is Lyrical Wax. I'm John Atak. I'm Ursula Wake. And today we're going to talk about one of my favourite writers, Richard Brodkin. Mm. I was first introduced to Richard Brodkin at the age of 18 when a friend of mine said um, that he had this book that he didn't like but that I would. <laughs> and it was um, a Confederate general from Big Sur, which Ursula tells me was um, Brodkin's first novel. Mm. It was my first Brodkin novel and I was entranced from the very first and uh, bought stories and poems. I've read all but one of his novels because it became too distressing, the condition he was describing in it. And um, it, it's been a lifelong attachment. He's become an influential writer. I think he is the writer mm. of the hippies. And um, as we were saying before, there's nothing pompous about him. Mm. He shows that mm. poetry is um, just a way of expressing ourselves. And um, when we express ourselves in the best possible way, and in his case, the funniest, most amusing possible mm. way, uh, and in an insightful way, then we make something wonderful, which uh, can be enjoyed. So how about we start with a uh, Richard mm. Brodkin poem? Yes, we will start with um, a poem called Up Against the Ivory Tower. I'm sitting here at a cafe, thinking about writing a poem. What will I write about? I don't know. I just feel like it. When suddenly, a young man in a hurry walks up to me and says, can I use your pen? There's an envelope in his hand. I want to address this. He takes my pen and addresses the envelope. He's very serious about it. He's really using that pen. I love that about the, um, as John was saying, about um, his attitude of sort of pricking any pomposity about being a poet, because he's a poet just kind of messing around, really, not quite sure. I'm a poet, I better write a poem, maybe I'll write a poem, I don't know. But then there's somebody who just needs a letter to get somewhere, and he's the one who makes the better use of the pen. Um and also, I love the fact that it's a, a poem almost about nothing. Mm. Um, so he's at the start of the poem. It's a sort of poem that there's something quite meta about it, where it, the poem almost sort of writes itself out of the fact that what am I going to write about? Mm. Um, don't know what I'm going to write about. A little incident happens and he's got something to write about. Mm. Um, I love that. Mm. Mm. Well, he is in a tradition of, of American writers, as far as certainly goes back to William Soroya, the Assyrian American, who in the 1930s published a book called The Daring Young Man on the Flying Trapeze. Mm -hmm. And he'd been contracted to write this book and he was so delighted that he decided he'd write a story every day. Mm. And he did. And he is just observing the world around him and the thoughts in his head. And I think Brodkin picks up that you know, it becomes a tradition mm. when Brodkin takes it on. And I think that, mm. that he is the great writer of the hippies. Mm. Um, you know, it's not Huntress Thompson who's brilliant and bizarre, but he doesn't mm. really represent hippies. He represents people who like guns and taking a lot of drugs yeah. Yeah. of all sorts. Yeah. Um, or uh, Wolf, uh, the electric Kool-Aid mm. acid test, which again is, is a vital book. Or maybe closer to the Mark Kankese. Um, with One Flow of the Cuckoo's Nest and sometimes a great notion. But Brotigan was there, was living it, was in San Francisco mm, through mm. the early 60s when the real hippie movement existed. Uh, Ken Kesey celebrated the death of hippie, I think, in February 1967, mm. just before the Summer of Love, when the media yeah. took on the idea of hippie. Yeah. But would Brotigan have considered himself a hippie? I'm <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> I'm not sure that he would have adopted the term. He he comes from the Beats of the generation mm. before. Um, he had long hair, um, <laughs> shoulder length mm. hair in the mid 60s, you know, when mm. the Beatles were just about managing to get their hair over their ears. Mm. Um, but I don't think he would have considered himself a member of any tribe. I think he was mm. a, a loner. And mm. I think with the early, the proto hippies, that's true of them all. They're breaking away from. Um, Part of, they're, they're adopting some of the beatnik ideas, mm. Jack Kerouac, William Burroughs, um, Phil Linghetti, uh, Ginsburg. Um, but they're 
which is also an observational form of writing, um, particularly, say, with Ginsberg or Kerouac. Um, but there's something lighter about them. There's you know, mm. something yeah. not so serious about mm. what they're doing. They're just living life and expressing themselves. Mm. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think I'm going to have to take yes, a book. Oh. Passing books so, to each other, fair yes. enough. We, we work and learn how to um, mm. juggle them. Um, but um, we didn't. While John finds his bit, <clears throat> I'm, I was just thinking, um, I keep thinking about Brautigan, that there's a similarity for me between him and Billy Collins, who did come mm. after Brautigan. All the, the, the range, overall, the range of little moments and nooks and crannies of life that Brautigan writes about feels really similar mm. to Billy Collins. I love the kind of... the the questions that Billy Collins carries around in his head, mm. and um, and I'm more familiar with him than with Brautigan, but um, yeah, there's a, a real similarity to that to between them, yeah. in that respect, I think. Absolutely. So yeah, over to you. Thank you. There is darkness on your lantern, and pumpkins in your wind, and oh, they clutter up your mind with their senseless bumping, or your heart is like a seagull, frozen into a long-distance telephone call. I'd like to take the darkness off your lantern and change the pumpkins into sky fields of ordered comets and disconnect the refrigerated telephone that frightens your heart into standing still. Mm. He is evidently aware of the surrealist poets. Yeah. Um, Breton Soupol. And but where they simply make absurdity because they're seeking to connect with pure psychic automatism, as Breton said. So just whatever comes out of mm. your head, you write mm. it down. You know, mm. Fish, bananas, old pyjamas, mutton, beef and trout, as Monty Python in their surrealist poetry had it. But with him, there is the inference of something more metaphysical in the, mm. um, you know, like the Kirikos painting, that, that there's an ominous shadow, there's something that you're being told that's not mm. just n nonsense that's pouring forth from the subconscious. He's making almost surrealist references. Your heart is like a seagull, mm. um, frozen into a long-distance telephone call. Mm. And you have to go away and wonder if there's, in fact, any sense in that or not, mm. which is not always the case with him. He's, he's often very open and you can see yeah. where he's going to go. Um, and again, something of his, um, his, his serious attitude that he took towards poetry, which we'll find here. Yes, very serious attitude. So serious that he was um, a poet in residence for a while at the California Institute of Technology. And during that residence, he wrote this. I don't care how goddamn smart these guys are. I'm bored. It's been raining like hell all day long. And there's nothing to do. I think that's fairly open. I don't think there's much, <laughs> um, there's much sort of secret uh, imagery in there. Similar to the last one that I read. Um, this is about... Sometimes, you know, poets can be built up into something, but actually, what are they doing? Mm. What are they doing, really? Um, it's taking money from the California Institute of Technology to <laughs> be bored. Right, yeah, to be bored and write about how there's nothing to do as a poet. Yeah. So we're bringing together good writing. Um, and it. so we will mm. talk about song lyrics, where they're well written, uh, as so many of them are. Um, poetry in its straightforward form, but also what, what some people call prose poems, um, or even belles lettres if they speak French. Mm -hmm. um, and that edges off into short stories, and Richard Brautigan is, is one of the great masters of the short story, along with mm -hmm. Guy de Maupassant, Anton Chekhov, uh, Somerset Maugham, that he can tell you something mm -hmm. and make you go away and have to wonder about what you've been told and he can amuse the hell out of you while he's doing mm. it. This is a story from the collection Revenge of the Lawn. I'm not going to hold the cover up because I don't like it. 
and which is the second Brushkin book I, I bought. Um, this copy has 1975 written into it, which gives you a slight clue to my age. Um, and this story, the collection is called Revenge of the Lawn, and the title story is absolutely wonderful, but probably a little bit too long for our purposes, sadly. Mm -hmm. We may get to it, you know, if enough people write in the comments section how desperately they want us to read Revenge of the Lawn. Well, yeah, we'll then we can definitely. We'll do it. We can read War and Peace if yeah, people, enough people yeah, say so. That's it. We can read um, Lord of the Rings backwards yeah. if we pay in the large Elvish. amount in Elvish. <laughs> But in the meantime, um, this is Pacific Radio Fire. The largest ocean in the world starts or ends at Monterey, California. It depends on what language you're speaking. My friend's wife had just left him. She walked right out the door and didn't even say goodbye. We went and got two-fifths of port and headed for the Pacific. It's an old song that's been played on all the jukeboxes in America. The song has been around so long that it's been recorded on the very dust of America and it has settled on everything and changed chairs and cars and toys and lamps and windows into billions of phonographs to play that song back into the ear of our broken heart. We sat down on a small corner-like beach surrounded by big granite rocks and the hugeness of the Pacific Ocean with all its vocabularies. We were listening to rock and roll on his transistor radio and somberly drinking port. We were both in despair. I didn't know what he was going to do with the rest of his life either. I took another sip of port. The Beach Boys were singing a song about California girls on the radio. They liked them. His eyes were wet wounded rugs. Like some kind of strange vacuum cleaner, I tried to console him. I recited the same old litanies that you say to people when you try to help their broken hearts, but words can't help at all. It's just the sound of another human voice that makes the only difference. There's nothing you're ever going to say that's going to make anybody happy when they're feeling shitty about losing somebody that they love. Finally, he set fire to the radio. He piled some paper around it. He struck a match to the paper. We sat there watching it. I had never seen anybody set fire to a radio before. As the radio gently burned away, the flames began to affect the songs that we were listening to. A record that was number one on the top 40 suddenly dropped to number 13 inside of itself. A song that was number nine became number 27 in the middle of a chorus about loving somebody. They tumbled in popularity like broken birds. Then it was too late for all of them. <laughs> That's wonderful, isn't it? It is. Marvellous. Yeah, and thank you for finding my place. That's quite all right. <laughs> you like people to know their place. <laughs> I can't ever learn that. No, and she's a bad girl. <laughs> so, um, this one that I'm going to read is a very different style from everything we've been reading so far, and as far as I'm aware, a very unusual style for Brautigan altogether, would mm. you say? Yeah, yeah? It's a, it's a, I don't know anything else in his work quite like it. Mm. Um, it's called She Sleeps This Very Evening in Greenbrook Castle. Um, I did try to find out if Greenbrook Castle was a real place. I've not found anywhere that exists. Um, but there is a diner name. in New Jersey, in, in Greenbrook, Greenbrook, New Jersey, New Jersey, called the White Castle. Yeah. If anybody would like to go and see if that's got anything to do with this, which we very much doubt. And we hope you appreciate the plug up in White Castle. Yes, yeah. Um, so the poem goes like this. She sleeps this very evening in Greenbrook Castle without the comfort of husband. And what she knows is what she dreams. He isn't dead, and he isn't alive. And the crack of light beneath the door is like the tail of a cat as she paces in her room. She sleeps this very evening in Greenbrook Castle without the comfort of husband. And what she knows is what she dreams. He isn't dead, 
and he isn't alive. And the light in her window is like a wedding ring, shining to the dark and distant woods. She sleeps this very evening in Greenbrook Castle without the comfort of husband. And what she knows is what she dreams. He isn't dead, and he isn't alive. And the light that reflects her golden hair is the answer to her marriage and the children of her prayers. It's a very, very different tone, isn't it? Mm. Both um, so tone and structure. So that kind of um, repetition and the structure and if you quick look, it looks very traditional on the page. Mm. So the tone is melancholy. There isn't that those sudden sparks of wryness or, or anything else. It's mm. a it's just a thorough melancholy sad poem very effective but very it's it's interesting that he's he didn't decide to oh no I'm, that's not my kind of thing i want to be, do something far more um progressive far more interesting he's he's actually thought no, no, no. do you know what that's going in this collection mm. or somebody decided that anyway he must have submitted it somewhere <laughs> yeah and and that idea of of repeating a statement Mm. To emphasise it, something I've used since I was a teenager in writing. Mm. Just, I don't remember anybody teaching me to do it. It just mm. seems natural to say the thing again and mm. then explore a little further. Yeah. Um, yeah. So the the bits that he's exploring are the different. You you get a picture of um, of this woman and and the state of mind that she's in, just through three descriptions of light. Mm. Don't yeah. you? The crack of light under the door and she's pacing in, in the room and then the light in her window and then the light that reflects in her golden hair. Mm. Yeah. It's very, it it's, seems very simple, but there's something very subtle and um, interesting about it, I think. Yeah, yeah. If I might... Um, of course. Have, hand the book I want and this book. That one, is it? Oh, right. <laughs> I told you we were going to do juggling. <laughs> and all we have to do is... On this, um, yes, definitely a beautiful call. <clears throat> Death is a beautiful car parked only to be stolen on a street lined with trees whose branches are like the intestines of an emerald. You hotwire death, get in and drive away like a flag made from a thousand burning funeral parlours. You have stolen death because you're bored. There's nothing good playing at the movies in San Francisco. You joyride around for a while listening to the radio and then abandon death, walk away and leave death for the police to find. And here we have metaphor, the, the, mm. uh, the great um, foundation of, of so much literature this idea of comparing one thing to another and we will mm. at some point get into Ogden Nash's critique of that mm. which is a wonderful poem called Very Like a Whale um, but there's something mysterious here. Mm. death is a beautiful car parked only to be stolen on a street lined with trees whose branches are like the intestines of an emerald mm. you know that mm. so he like the Surrealists at times makes statements that probably are unfathomable and he just liked the idea of getting us to chase after his thought. And yes. <clears throat> yeah, I like that phrase, actually. Mm. And that's, and I enjoy doing exactly mm. that thing. Yeah. Yeah. And then it, every now and then you, you, you realise that he has actually told you something. Mm. You know, you're going to hotwire death this car and drive mm. off and leave it for the police to find when you're done mm. joyriding because mm. you're bored because there's nothing playing at the movies. So he's brought together his day mm. and sh shared it with us in, in this interesting fashion. Mm. I, I have wondered whether either he did that or somebody he knows did that and actually killed an animal or a person mm. while doing that just because he was bored so he nicked a car and blah 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 mm. and that actually there, there has been a death involved in that um which would fit for me but at the same time it also works as an extended metaphor in its in a uh, a more sort of surreal but interesting way 
Yeah. And it's from his adulthood because it, it's about San Francisco. He grew up in, in abject poverty mm. in uh, Seattle, in, in, or near Seattle in Washington State, um, which is where um, Jimi Hendrix came from, of course, as well, and uh, Kurt Cobain. So uh, there we go. So this is in his adult life that he's um, reflecting upon something. I've never really thought of it over these many years since I first read it. I've never thought of it as, a, as an actual episode, mm. as a real story. Mm. It's always seemed to me to be a pure metaphor. But mm. um, we'll now Fair go enough. and read the biographies of Richard Broughton and hopefully everybody watching will go and do the same mm. and um, tell us the, you know, the name of the person who stole the car. <laughs> uh, there is an interesting other connection to Jimi Hendrix, which is completely irrelevant, which is that Jimi Hendrix was caught in joyriding in a stolen car when he was, I think, 18. And uh, he was a passenger in the car, but the judge mm. basically gave him the choice between going to prison or joining the military, which is how Jimi Hendrix came to become a parachuter in the 101st Airborne, <laughs> the Screaming Eagles. So there's a... A tangent, which yeah. I think Richard Brushkin would have approved of. No. <laughs> yes. I hope so. Um, thank you very much for sharing your time with us. Um, I am John Atak. And I'm Ursula Wake. Thank you.